Hello, and welcome everybody to the National Trends in Disability Employment, or NTIDE, Lunch and Learn series. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. We will post an archive of each webinar each month on our website at www.researchondisability.org slash ntide. This site will also provide copies of the presentations, the speakers' bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer. To ask questions of the speakers, click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Speakers will review these questions and provide answers during the last section of the webinar. Some questions may be answered directly in the Q&A box. If you have any questions following this recording, please contact us at disability.statistics at unh.edu or toll free at 866-538-9521 for more information. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy, Enjoy today's, today's webinar. webinar. Hi, everybody. This is Andrew Houghtonville. Um, I don't know if the screen has switched over to mine. It looks like it's stuck on Karen's. In any event, uh, welcome to this month's NTIDE. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So the monthly NTIDE, as, as was uh, mentioned, is held um, at noon Eastern on the day that the NTIDE report is released. Uh, it's a joint effort of UNH uh, Kessler Foundation and the American University Centers on Developmental Disability. Um, it's a part of the Research and Training Center on Employment Policy and Measurement, which is funded by the National Institute on Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. That's NIDLER. Next slide. Uh, so uh, the, the layout of this webinar is like we've had in past year, our past uh, months. Uh, John O'Neill and I will talk about the results of the NTIDE. Uh, we'll also hear from Denise uh, Razal from AUCD, uh, and she will uh, have a nice interview with Cody. Uh, then we'll hear from uh, Kermit Cabela. Uh, I probably said your Kel, I'll let you Kermit pronounce his name. Uh, from the National Skills Coalition. Uh, again, uh, question and answers will be at the end of the webinar. So John, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, thank you, Andrew. Good day, everybody. Um, the monthly NTIDE report is a, uh, is a press release with an infographic that looks at the latest employment statistics. And um, the and it uses information from the jobs report, which is released by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics on the first Friday of each month. And as Andrew mentioned, it's a joint effort between the Kessler Foundation and UNH. Uh, matter of fact, this, this month, uh, uh, we celebrate the fifth year of reporting out these uh, disability employment statistics fifth year, sorry, if I said fourth. Um, next slide, please. Um, the source of the data is from the current population survey, and it's the same survey that gives us the official unemployment rate that the press makes so much of. And uh, the data is on civilians age uh, 16 to 64 not living in institutions. And this information has been available since 2008 um, when the six disability questions were added to the CPS uh, for the first time. Uh, the data is not yet seasonally adjusted, uh, which is why we compare uh, to the same month in the past year. Uh, next slide. I think I'm handing it off to you, Andrew, but before I do, I, I want to take a little of your thunder, not too much. Sure. Uh, but, <laughs> but this is the uh, 20, we marked the 24th month uh, of consecutive improvement in the employment statistics for people with disabilities. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Andrew, to uh, review the details. 
All right, John. So this month, uh, the employment of people, the employment, so that's the percentage employed, employment to population ratio increased from 28.6% to 37, 31.7%. That's a 10.8% increase or a 3.1 uh, percentage point uh, increase. The employment to population ratio of people without disabilities really didn't move much at all, uh, only increasing uh, three percentage points, uh, 0 0.3 percentage points. In terms of labor force participation, so this is a percentage of people in, in the population that are either working or actively looking for work. So this adds on from the previous slide, this adds on the, the people who are looking for work actively. And so uh, it increased 7.7% for people with disabilities. And um, that's, so that's a 2.5%, 2.5% uh, percentage point increase. And again, we see almost no movement in the employment of people without disabilities. So this suggests some of the news you may be hearing uh, that's good news about the economy is really uh, good news about uh, people without disabilities, which is an interesting thought. Um, although the numbers in the regular economy are month to month changes, so it, it doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, so here you see the long-term time trend. Uh, and this is what John was talking about. Uh, I don't know if people can follow the cursor, but what we really are seeing is, uh, you know, kind of two blocks of years. We've got the block of years from, say, uh, you know, 2014 to 15, and then we have 2016 to 2017, and now into, um, oops, I went a little too fast. Uh, so we see that block, th these two blocks are, you know, one is, is, is dominantly better than the other one. So there's a, uh, dominance meaning it's always bigger. So we have these last uh, 24 uh, uh, month stretch where we've had uh, uh, improvements. And so in terms of since the Great Recession, again, so if you don't know, we the, the Census Bureau and Bureau of Labor Statistics started to, get, to generate data for people with disabilities only uh, in uh, say September of 2000 uh, eight, and that's that's just after the big job loss months of the Great Recession. So you do see a continued decline in in the percentage of people working after the Great Recession is it continues to decline, um, and then starts to build since 2010 for people without disabilities. So that's kind of the slow march, the slow progress made in terms of of job growth, uh, and you know it's basically starting to reach its its pre-recession levels. Although again, this is not you know, we don't have the numbers just before the recession. Um, and then, so people with disabilities, you know, we really aren't seeing that improvement until the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it kind of can be viewed except for that big jagged point that, you know, down here uh, at the end of 2003, beginning of 2014. You know, if you took that out, it's really kind of flat over the last, you know, between 2011 and 2016 and then rising, uh, starting to rise in 16 and 17, and now into 18. And you see how big this jump was this last year, um, uh, this, last, uh, time, this last month. And so we're really comparing these huge, huge differences. Um, so that's, that's kind of the story we're looking at. And there have been some, some press in this area, not necessarily citing us, but there's been some press in this area. Uh, and so if you're interested in seeing some of the takes let's say the New York Times uh, reporters have put on it or, or others, um, uh, you can see some of their statements. Now, there, there, there's some really interesting discussions about why this might be occurring now, but there's a typical story about full employment that, that as the economy becomes where almost everybody is employed, uh, employers start reaching out uh, to places where they typically haven't reached out, but also workers if wages start to rise, workers say without disability, or workers with disabilities may be, uh, 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 it may be worth more, it may be worth their while to go back into the labor market and overcome a lot of the barriers that say transportation barriers and things like that, uh, that, that they couldn't with the, with the previous wage rate. So uh, wages have started to increase a little bit. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have wage data uh, available in this uh, in this, uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Uh, again, John, thank you for stealing my thunder, but 
indeed, we have seen an increase. Um, uh, let's hope the, the trend keeps going. I'll turn it over to Denise. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Um, let me, I want to preface this by just saying that um, usually we have an interview with a person with a disability who's employed. We had somebody scheduled today, Cody, who was one of the Promise, um, the folks benefiting from Promise, which you heard about uh, last month. Um, it ended up being a conflict with school for him, which you can understand. So Cody is going to be with us sometime this summer. Um, I'll say- No, I don't understand that. He, he could have skipped school. He could have skipped school. No, actually, and the good news is, what his mom said was he'd already skipped school at one point for his senior trip. And so she didn't want to pull him out of school again for today. And I thought, you know what? That's perfect. That's exactly what any mom for any kid would say. He got to go on his senior trip, and anyway, he'll join us one day this summer uh, for one of the, the um, July or August, and we're scheduling that right now. So um, I just don't want to mislead people. Cody's not on with us today. I'll say a minute more about him but um, when we get to that part, but he will join us this summer. Okay, so first, next slide. One of, I'm really excited. I'm Oops. trying. Okay, you're trying. Um, I'm really excited this month because a lot of the things I have to highlight are all either um, for advocates or in even more important by advocates about employment. And I think that's very exciting and I wanna highlight these for you. This is a new um, piece that's just come out. It's called A Purpose in Life, Why Employment First Matters to Self-Advocates. And it's a joint piece that Think ThinkWork has produced. It's joint between SAVE and um, the self-advocates becoming empowered and Green Mountain Self Advocates, and it's on employment first. And what they did was they interviewed 21 self advocates about what's going on in their states on employment first. And there are the themes there that you can read, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities want to work. None of this should be surprising to anybody on this call. People with disabilities want equal rights and to employment benefits, and the barriers continue to exist to closing sheltered work. But I want to read you a couple of the quotes from this and I really want to say to you, you probably want to go download this one because it's, um, it's really good. Um, and there are lots of quotes from self-advocates in it. So here are a couple of quotes I want you to hear. I'm the oldest. I have a brother and a sister, and they do not have disabilities. My siblings don't have the option of not working, so why should I? We all need money to pay for our basic needs like rent, food, health care, and fun stuff. Isn't that what it's all about? That's exactly what we're saying. And there's another one in there that I loved um, from another self-advocate. There's kind of this myth out there that if you receive aid, you can't get a job, which is just not true. In fact, they want you to get a job. They want you to seek employment. Again, isn't that what we're all saying? I really recommend this one to you. It's by self-advocates for use by self-advocates or anyone. It's a, I keep telling you I have this folder at my desk. This is another one that I'm sticking in my folder so that I have um, access to all the time. Okay, next one. Next slide, Andrew. Another one. This is by um, NCWD's Youth Action Council. It's on transition. It's a video series for youth by youth about transitioning out of high school. Again, these are, these are youth telling their stories and giving tips and advice to other youth about what comes next and about what transition is all about. Um, one of the youth talks about how she actually she stayed in school through 21 because she had that was best for her and then she got a job after that another was talking about how she volunteered somewhere that led to a job another was talking about college and making choices for college uh, what I particularly like about this other than the fact that just use youth for youth is that um, it's it gives tips and advice for other youth on what to do and how you too can do this. So I loved this one too. Um, and I love that it's a video. We have all kinds of paper. This one's a video. Okay, next one, Andrew. This is another one. Um, this is on individual, the individualized learning plan. This is uh, one that's funded by ODEP, uh, targeted specifically to students um, that helps them make the connection between high school and college and jobs and career choices. And again, this one is, is short. It's basically called, it's called a toolkit, but it's about the, the video, the, no, no, the um, logo or whatever on the website is about kickstart. So how do I kickstart my ILP? 
and how does that help me and what is that and why is that important to me? And again, it leads kids from high school into transition. And I know a lot of the folks on this call, we focus a lot on employment in the adult years. I know a lot of folks on this call are interested in transition. So this is another one. Um, next slide, Andrew. Oops. It's okay. I have another one that's, um, again, more ILPs. This one's again from, uh, this one's from NW, NCWD uh, Youth again. Uh, they have an entire website on innovative stories in transition that are specific to states and examples of state programs. They just added two new ones, one for Delaware and one for DC, that talks about um, what are what is happening in those states. And there are other ones on other states up there that you can go and look at. I thought that was fabulous. And then another, this one on IOPs, this is promoting quality in IOPs. Um, this one is kind of their update to their previous ILT guide, um, how-to guide. And again, it's practical advice and strategies and all of those things. This one is much longer and more detailed. I wouldn't say this one is targeted to students particularly. This one is more targeted to um, service providers, families. Again, it goes through a lot of detail about ILPs, but, um, but the other one is more targeted to students. This one's more targeted to others. But what's nice about this one is it does look at all kinds of age groups. It looks at elementary, secondary, post-secondary, workforce, non-school settings. Um, and I thought that was really interesting as well. Next one, Andrew. There we go. Um, this is another one that I was really pleased to see. This one's a slideshow. Um, and they're 30-second slideshows. This one is on moving along to employment. Uh, this is by Boston University Center for Psych Rehab um, and funded by Nidler and SAMHSA. And this one is specifically targeted to employment for people with mental health conditions. And there are a series of 30 slide, 30 second slideshows. They target, there are different slideshows for different targeted populations. So there are several 30 second slideshows targeted specifically to people with mental health conditions, uh, people in recovery. There were several that were targeted to service providers and employers. There were some targeted to family members. And I thought, again, this one, and this one is nice because it includes, at the end of the 30 seconds, um, it includes a question to be answered and also links to resources. And again, as all of you on this call know, we don't have anywhere near as much as we need, I suppose, for um, folks with uh, mental health conditions, um, psychiatric conditions. So. This one was a, a really good one, I thought that, and again, you know, this month I found a bunch of things that weren't just paper or online electronic. This time there are slideshows and videos and um, quotes, and I was, I was really pleased to see all of this. Okay, next one, Andrew. This is a, okay, so this is an infographic, and in a minute we'll go to the next slide, which has the information about the infographic and who did it. This one just showed up in my email box this week, and I thought it was really interesting because it talks about career and technical education, CTE, and specifically targeted to students with disabilities. And it's not by a disability organization. It's actually um, by a group that, we'll go to it in just a second, college and career readiness, we'll go to it in a second. I actually, why don't you flip to that, Andrew? So there it is. College and career readiness, oh, back one. Back one, okay. College of Career Readiness and Success Center, which is at the American Institutes for Research. It's funded by Office of Elementary and Secondary Ed, but it's um, it's in partnership with, I think it's the the superintendent. So it's it's in partnership with some general ed folks. Okay, now, would you go back one more, Andrew, back to the infographic? So I thought it was really interesting that it was going out to a whole host of CTE folks and not just folks in the disability community. And so I thought that was really nice. And I thought it was, um, we don't often talk as much about CTE as we should. And it's actually one of the things that Kermit's gonna talk about um, in a minute um, when our guest speaker. But I thought this was a nice one. And so I, and easy to understand and looking at it, um, I thought it was a good one. I thought I'd give it to you. So um, infographics, another good way to see quickly what's going on. Um, okay, next one, Andrew. And then one more, there you go. 
Um, this one, actually, Deb Brucker from UNH pointed out to me, which is the, um, the National Beneficiary Survey Disability Statistics out of SSA, using the 2015 statistics. So, um, you know, it's the, it's the general one that comes out. It's looking at beneficiary statistics and health and program and service participation, the employment stuff. Um, but it also takes a look at some of the employment interaction with benefits. And so Deb pointed these out in particular, but the more I dipped into this, um, the more I thought there was a lot more information here if you haven't seen it. Um, specific, and the links are, the links where it says tables 15 and 17 go directly to those tables, um, whereas the link at the top goes to the overall, overall survey. So um, about a quarter of people of SSA beneficiaries say they don't work because they're discouraged from prior work attempts, 25%. Hmm. More work to do there. Um, about a quarter don't work because others think they're not capable. That's, again, probably not a surprise, but 25% is a lot. Um, more than a quarter still say that employers are not accessible. That one I thought, oh, no. Um, and then um, in table 35, many beneficiaries are not aware of the work incentives that are available to employees or to them to work. I thought all of those were things that, first of all, I can imagine are not surprising to people on the call, but secondly, um, all of those are things that fit in and you can use with employers, that you can use with grant applications, that you, I can imagine a whole host of places where this information would be really helpful. So I thought I'd stick that one in for you as well. Um, next slide, Andrew. I think this is the fun one. Yeah. So I don't know if all of you saw this this month, but as I said, and now for something completely different, um, Apple has applied for to, to Unicode for 13 new emojis, all dealing with disability. And these are some examples. Um, obviously, Unicode, as I understand, it needs to approve these. But um, I thought they were very cool. They're um, active. The the people using wheelchairs clearly are moving. Um, the one for the person with the cane, if you're blind, I thought was really interesting. Again, moving, active. The dog, there are two different dog ones. One for, um, obviously, the one down in the right corner is more of a guide dog for those who are blind. The one up in the left corner with the vest is probably more as a support animal. Um, but I just thought these were very cool. If you haven't seen them, um, Somebody, the one for folks with hearing aids, but there's also one for folks who are deaf. Um, I thought they were very cool. We'll have to watch and see. Um, I assume they'll be approved. I certainly hope so. And when they come out, make good use of those because I think, um, both I, th I think from Apple's point of view, you, developing them was really smart. And um, from our point of view, I just thought they were, they were exciting and interesting and wanted you to see them if you hadn't seen them. They got some really good news coverage this week as well, which I thought was, uh, that can never hurt. Um, okay, next slide. Oh, this was the guest interview. So let's skip to the next one. This is Cody. Um, Cody will be with us later in the summer. There is a video on the Wisconsin Promise Project on Cody if you wanna see that earlier, but um, otherwise, wait and you'll hear from Cody personally. Um, about his story later in the summer. Go ahead and flip it, Andrew, to the next one. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Kermit, who is our speaker for the day. Kermit is the federal policy director at the National Skills Coalition, where he directs the organization's Washington-based efforts to advance a national skills strategy within federal legislation, agency regulation, and national funding initiatives. Um, Kermit helps states and local legal state and local leaders in federal policy advocacy, both within Washington and in their home districts, and works with the National Skills Coalition field staff and partner organizations to improve state and local implementation of federal programs. Kermit holds a JD and a bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary. I also want to add that um, I just I started talking with Kermit because of a connection. I had through a previous job, um, but I suddenly realized that a lot of the work the National Skills Coalition is doing is not something that those of us in the disability community are necessarily aware of. And I'm not sure that the folks at the National Skills Coalition, the members, are always as aware of disability as yet another 
job category. And so I thought it was a really nice marriage. Kermit and I have done some talking. I went to their conference this year um, when they were in DC. And, um, and it's a really nice marriage of what happened or could be. And I think there's a lot of work to be done here. And Kermit and I have talked about that. So I asked him um, to come and speak about what the National Skills Coalition does, the kinds of legislation they're working on, which is why you didn't hear a lot from me right now today about federal policy, which you usually do, um, and to talk about the kinds of interaction that might happen for the disability community and why we might be interested in some of the work that they're doing. Kermit, I'm going to toss it to you. Okay, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you, Denise, for the, for the great introduction, um, and I'm very excited to be a part of the conversation today. Um, as Denise said, I'm the Federal Policy Director for National Skills Coalition. NSC is a, is a 501c3 uh, a research and advocacy group or a multi-stakeholder coalition uh, comprised of business leaders, labor unions, community colleges, community-based organizations, state and local officials, and others uh, who, who are advocating for expanded access to high quality education and training across a range of different federal and state policies. Um, we are we are not specific to one particular stakeholder group. We're not specific to one particular uh, service population. What we're really trying to do as an organization is, is expand access for all workers and for all industries uh, to help make sure that uh, all individual all U.S. In, uh, workers can get the the skills and the credentials they need to be successful in the labor market, uh, and businesses can find the workers that they're they're looking for. Um, and as Denise said, I'm, I'm going to focus, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of the work that I'm doing at the federal policy level, some of the key federal policies that we're working on right now. Um, and not so much, I'm not going to be looking at this so much from a, from the, a specific lens around disability, but I do think that many of these conversations that are happening uh, are conversations where, uh, where advocates ought to be uh, engaged and ought to be thinking about the role of uh, of the folks that you're you're trying to work with at the, at the state and the local level and making sure that they have uh, access to these these programs and, and opportunities. Um, so if we could go to the, the next slide. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, let me just sort of say, so just in general, I think, um, and this kind of ties into the, the opening uh, uh, presentation around the, 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 the current state of the labor market. So right now, I think there's, the, the idea of workforce development and education is, is, a very, is a very hot topic here in Washington. And, and a lot of that is being driven by the fact that the economy is very, very strong right now. Uh, we're down, we have the lowest unemployment rate that we've had in, in almost, uh, I think in the last 20 years. Uh, and so there are a lot of employers who are talking about the need for, the, you know, the difficulty that they're finding, that they're having in finding skilled workers, uh, and increased pressure on policymakers at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level uh, to, to advance policies that help uh, businesses find the workers that they need. And, and as, as was noted in the earlier part of the, the presentation, uh, I think there is a, a growing awareness on the part of many, many business leaders that um, with, un, with you know, essentially a full employment economy that they need to be thinking about uh, strategies and models that help them reach into worker populations that they have not necessarily had to pay attention to in, in the past. Uh, and so I do think that there are some real opportunities while the economy is strong uh, for uh, advocates uh, working with uh, a range of subpopulations to make sure that uh, those individuals are getting access to the both the economic opportunities that exist today, but also uh, establishing the pipelines that can help make sure that workers have access to jobs in, in the future. Um, I, I mentioned on the slide uh, WIOA implementation. I'm going to talk about that in a second. So I, uh, I'm guessing a number of the folks on, on the call are, are reasonably familiar with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, there's the, the law, I'm not working on this very much right now from a federal policy perspective because it's, you know, we're now in the implementation phase of WIOA, but there are some, some things that folks should probably be aware of, uh, including some risks that we see in the, in the next few, uh, the next year or so around WIOA implementation. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about some of the other skills conversations, the other policy debates that are happening here in Washington that impact skills. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Um, and I'll just, so I'll just um, uh, 
in terms of sort of the, the, the lens that National Skills Coalition works on, so when we do our advocacy, what we're looking at are generally uh, trying to expand access to what we call middle skilled jobs. And what that means are jobs that require more than a high school uh, diploma, but not necessarily a four year college degree. So these would be jobs that could be supported through an apprenticeship or through an associate's degree or a certificate or, or, or an industry recognized credentials uh, at your local community college, uh, other opportunities like that. The reason why we focus on middle skill jobs, as you can see here, um, this is when, you know, when we hear about skills gaps, when we hear employers talking about the need for skilled workers, in many cases, the gap that we're seeing is in these middle skill jobs. So these are jobs that often pay a, a family supporting wage, um, but they require uh, education beyond uh, sort of the basic uh, skills that you would get uh, with a high school diploma. They require some form of specialized education and training. And we don't, as a society, do a lot of uh, investment in these middle skill pathways and, and making sure that people can find these pathways. And so a lot of our policy efforts are built around uh, strengthening the availability of training programs at the sub-baccalaureate level to make sure that people can get into these jobs and get the skills and the credentials they need and make sure that employers can find workers at this level. Um, this isn't intended to be a policy lens that, that disfavors uh, access to four-year degrees. You know, in fact, many of the Many of the, the programs that we work with are intentionally building pathways that allow somebody to transition to a four-year degree. Uh, but the idea is that in many cases, uh, people need to work uh, even while they're going to school. And so making sure that they can find a uh, family supporting wage while they're going to school or, or, or creating opportunities where they could go back to school and advance in a career, that's, that's where we tend to focus our energies. Uh, next slide. Um, and we're, we're also doing advocacy in, uh, against the backdrop of uh, significant disinvestment in workforce development policies. Um, so you can see from this chart, we, we, um, this obviously does not include um, uh, uh, vocational rehabilitation programs, but you know, some of the main programs that we focus on at the federal level are uh, the WIOA uh, uh, Title I job training programs, the Perkins programs, uh, that, uh, career and technical education programs that Denise just mentioned, uh, adult education, we track a number of other programs. Um, one of the reasons why we focus on, um, on uh, one of the main things that we focus on at, at National Skills Coalition is trying to uh, expand uh, uh, funding for, increase funding for workforce development uh, in, a, in an environment in which there's been a lot of uh, downward pressure on these investments. You can see um, this is a chart that we put together last year in response to uh, uh, President Trump's budget proposal uh, the, this administration has proposed some pretty significant cuts to a range of different job training programs, uh, and we uh, we do a lot of advocacy to try to uh, uh, forestall these cuts and, and, and get funding increases. I'm pleased to say that um, <clears throat> in the most recent omnibus uh, that uh, the Congress passed uh, late last month, uh, all of these numbers uh, actually went up. So we saw an increase in funding for WIOA uh, Title I grants, the job training grants, of about $80 million over current levels. Uh, for Perkins, it was about uh, it was about $75 million over current levels. Uh, for adult education, it was about $35 million above current levels. Uh, and I know there was also an increase in funding for the vocational, re vocational rehabilitation state grants. Um, I think that speaks to the fact that uh, there is a lot of interest in workforce development at the congressional level. I think there's a real understanding that uh, the federal government hasn't always carried its weight in terms of investing in skills and, and credentials. And so uh, so we're pleased uh, to see that, but uh, obviously continue to have work ahead of us over the course of the next uh, few years. Um, if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'll just briefly uh, talk about the, 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 the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act um, and sort of what's going on with WIOA. Uh, obviously, WIOA was... Uh, was, was passed in, in July of 2014, uh, and it covers uh, a range of programs, so uh, uh, job training programs under Title I, adult education under Title II, um, what's called the Wagner-Pizer Employment Service under Title III, uh, vocational rehabilitation state grants under Title IV. Uh, WIOA is currently in the process of being implemented, so the sort of the first full year of implementation uh, started, in, we started in 2016 when states were required to submit uh, their first state plans under WIOA. 
Uh, and uh, as part of that process, they were supposed to uh, uh, outline uh, a coordinated strategy across all of the different core programs, through, uh, titles one through four, uh, and also uh, in, in some cases to describe where how they would be coordinating other federally funded programs like TANF or SNAP or, or career and technical education with their investments under under WIOA. So states have been um, have been in the process of implementing WIOA over the course of uh, the last two years. Uh, under the under these state plans that they submitted in 2016, uh, under the law, all of the states are required to were required to submit uh, plan modifications earlier this year. Um, so these were two-year plan modifications that were due to the Department of Labor on March 15th. Uh, as far as we know, all states have submitted their their updated state plans. Um, one of the things we have not had a chance to go through and review all of those plans. One of the things that we're looking at as States are, are starting are continuing the implementation of this process is how well they are thinking about integrating uh, the the different programs that are un, that are authorized under WIOA. You know, one of the key com complaints about the, the the predecessor law, the Workforce Investment Act, was yeah. that it authorized yeah. of programs but didn't really do a whole lot to coordinate services. So, for example, uh, we often heard about. Uh, individuals who you know, with with disabilities who would show up at the at the American Job Centers or the One Stop Centers and and wouldn't necessarily get services under other programs because uh, they're uh, uh, because they would auto often be automatically referred to the to the uh, vocational rehabilitation system. So one of the things that we're watching uh, and we're gonna we're gonna start to do a review of the state plans uh, in a couple of months. Uh, but one of the things that we're watching is whether or not states are taking advantage of the opportunity under WIOA to think more comprehensively about uh, the broad range of individuals with barriers to employment that are supposed to be receiving services under the coordinated system. Um, one thing that's, that's kind of important to know about um, WIOA implementation right now is um, this is the first year, uh, this program year that's gonna start in July, is gonna be the first year that states are gonna to need to be negotiating performance uh, metrics under uh, under the common performance uh, measures that were established under WIO. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, under under WIOA, all of the core programs, the adult job training programs, the adult education, vocational rehabilitation, and the employment services, are all subject to a set of common performance metrics around employment, earnings, credential attainment, uh, skills gains, and employer uh, satisfaction. Um, we have not been states are have not been negotiating performance outside of the Title I program uh, because in many cases these are new performance measures for the core program. So adult education and vocational rehabilitation these are new performance measures that that haven't been used in the system before. And so over the last two years, states have been collecting information on these performance metrics for these programs in order to establish a performance baseline for those programs. Starting this year, program year 18, states are required to start uh, negotiating expected performance rates for adult education, the employment services, and vocational rehabilitation under these new performance metrics. And the theory here is that because you have these common performance metrics, it will be easier for the various core programs that are established under WIOA to work together since they don't have competing performance metrics. I think the, the jury is still out on how well this is going to work. One of the things that states have the option of doing is using what's called the regression model, where they, uh, use, where they will calculate their per expected performance rates based on uh, the uh, individual participant characteristics of, of, the, of the folks that they intend to be serving through these various programs. And what that means is that they would hopefully be negotiating uh, performance on the basis of what is a realistic set of expectations for uh, the populations that they're serving through each of these programs. Um, I think that, again, we, we, this is the first time that states will be negotiating these performance rates, and so it's unclear how this is going to work out. Um, but this is definitely something that we're going to be watching over the, next, uh, over the next six to nine months as states go through this process. The last thing I'll, I'll mention on WIOA is, um, you know, so uh, overall, Congress uh, was was relatively supportive in the funding process in you know in the in the in the fiscal year 2018 omnibus bill that just got passed. 
we saw uh, modest increases in funding for a range of different workforce development programs, including vocational rehabilitation. Um, however, as, as folks may know, the administration has not been a big fan of the, the broader workforce development system, system under WIOA. They proposed pretty dramatic cuts to job training and career and technical education, adult education, and a range of other services. Um, while Congress didn't, expe didn't accept those, uh, those proposed cuts, uh, we, we do believe that the administration is going to continue to push for uh, consolidation and, and funding cuts across a range of different programs. Uh, they certainly proposed a number of cuts in their in the in FY19 uh, budget proposal. So we're going to continue to work with our national partners to make sure that Congress gets the message that they need to continue to invest in uh, this broad range of programs to make sure that, that workers and, and, and job seekers can get the skills that they need. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. So I want to I want to close um, with uh, just kind of a quick overview of, of three uh, big policy debates that are happening in Washington right now, um, uh, beyond workforce uh, WIOA uh, and sort of the the role that that skills play in those in those conversations. So one big conversation that's happening here in Washington is 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 about the future of post-secondary education and the, and the federal role in, in post-secondary education. Um, and there's a growing interest here in, here in DC uh, around uh, rethinking how post-secondary education responds to the needs of employers. I think there's a growing perception that uh, the, the traditional higher education has not been particularly responsive to the needs of the business community and, 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 and an interest in trying to make sure that federal policy makes uh, programs better align with the, with the needs of, of employers as they're hiring. Um, there's also, I think, a growing awareness that many students, that, that a majority of today's post-secondary students are non-traditional in some way. Um, in, that, in some cases, that means that they're financially independent or they're older working adults. Uh, in some cases, it's students who have disabilities. Uh, uh, we have a number of, uh, uh, of students today who are, uh, are parents. Uh, uh, or, or are otherwise uh, classified as non-traditional in some way. Um, there's a there's a recognition, I think, on, on Capitol Hill at least, that that that, that college uh, colleges need to be better uh, better connected to the need, the various needs of students who are of, of the, the diverse student population that they're seeing these days. Uh, and I think there's an interest on the part of policymakers in trying to figure out how they can address that. Um, uh, but I think there's not yet clarity on how they're going to try to move that forward. So I mentioned here some of the key issues that policymakers are looking at. Um, there's, a, there's a significant interest here in Washington around the idea of expanding financial aid programs to uh, better align with uh, occupational programs and, uh, and career pathways, recognizing that not everybody goes to, to uh, pursue post-secondary education right out of high school and, and not everybody is going to pursue post-secondary education in a, in, a, in a single go, that they may end up going to uh, college at various phases of their life or their careers. Um, there's a growing interest in, in accountability. So post-secondary education as a general rule, uh, particularly higher education programs, they don't have, um, we don't really collect a lot of data on, on program level outcomes for, uh, for students. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an interest, I think, from policymakers in um, whether or not we are collecting uh, sufficient uh, data on uh, employment earnings outcomes for college students uh, and, and identifying areas where colleges, uh, uh, both two-year and four-year institutions, could be doing a better job of serving uh, a broad range of students. Uh, and then there's also this question of student support. So recognizing that um, you know, attendance at, at post-secondary institutions is not just about tuition assistance, but there are, in many cases, a lot of supports that students need, whether that's uh, career counseling or, uh, or assistive technology or uh, uh, access to services like uh, childcare and transportation. Um, I think there's a, there's a real interest in, in Washington in trying to figure out how to better support students with those non-tuition aid uh, models. Uh, although, again, I think there's not yet consensus on how they would move that forward because, uh, as, as we know, uh, those things cost money and, and Congress is always kind of uh, in, a, in a tough place when it comes to spending money. Um, 
there's two pieces of legislation that, that impact post-secondary education, the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, um, which Denise mentioned. Um, that, uh, there, is a, there is a bill that passed the House unanimously, a reauthorization bill that passed the House unanimously uh, last year uh, in May of 2017. Um, it's being held up in the Senate uh, for political reasons, uh, but it, uh, there is at least some possibility that that will go through. Um, and this is a bill that uh, would provide $1.2 billion in funding for career and technical education at the secondary and post-secondary level. Uh, and then, of course, the, the big piece of legislation that impacts post-secondary institutions and students is the Higher Education Act. Um, there was a bill that was uh, the reauthorization bill that was passed out of the, the House Education and Workforce Committee uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, but it is not yet moved to the uh, to the House floor, and as of right now, it doesn't look like it will uh, move forward. So, um, uh, so that's kind of where things are. We can go to the next slide. Um, I'll just mention real quickly work-based learning and apprenticeship. Um, work-based learning and apprenticeship are very hot topics here in Washington. Um, as folks may know, uh, the administration released an executive order in uh, June of last year calling for expansion of apprenticeship. Um, and the, the main thrust of this executive order was uh, to try to expand apprenticeship into a range of industries where it hasn't been, uh, where it hasn't uh, really taken hold. Historically in this country, apprenticeship has largely been focused in uh, the construction trades and in manufacturing, uh, but there's a, uh, there's an increased interest from employers in healthcare and information technology and other industries uh, who are seeking ways to, to onboard uh, workers in new ways. So the administration put out an executive order uh, that is uh, calling for the expansion of apprenticeship into new industries, uh, and in particular, trying to identify ways to uh, to authorize apprenticeship programs outside of the current system of uh, of the registered apprenticeship system, which is a government-run system. Uh, so looking at ways that trade associations and other uh, uh, other third parties can approve programs for purposes of federal uh, federal financial aid and other uh, and other purposes. Um, the Congress is also very interested in apprenticeship. Um, last year, they appropriated ninety five million dollars to support apprenticeship uh, grants. Uh, this year, that number went up to one hundred and forty five million. Uh, the administration also has some discretionary dollars. Uh, about $200 million at the Department of Labor, separate and apart from these appropriations that they can be putting towards, uh, that they can be putting towards apprenticeship grants. Uh, they just uh, the other day, or j just yesterday, uh, announced the availability of funding for, uh, for programs, uh, faith and community-based programs uh, that are providing apprenticeship and, and related strategies for, uh, for, particularly for youth in, uh, in criminal justice systems. Um, uh, one of the one of the key points in the president's executive order from last year was uh, trying to expand our uh, apprenticeship opportunities for a range of populations who have not generally benefited from apprenticeship in the past. Um, individuals with disabilities were not specifically mentioned, I believe, in the executive order, but I do think that there is an interest at the uh, at the Department of Labor and the Department of Education in thinking about how apprenticeship can be more uh, more expa can be expanded to. Uh, populations that again have not often benefited from the apprenticeship uh, uh, model. Last but not least, I'll, um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll talk just briefly about um, the, the the this conversation around welfare reform, which I think will have some fairly significant impacts on, on a range of, of programs. Um, so uh, there has been, uh, for a number of years, uh, an interest uh, from some uh, leadership, uh, Republican leadership in Congress around uh, entitlement reform. Uh, as folks uh, are probably have heard, um, there, you know, we've, we've seen an expansion of uh, the SNAP program and Medicaid uh, under the Obama administration. Uh, and uh, there's been a real push from congressional leadership now joined by the by the Trump administration around uh, trying to dial back uh, some of the expansion of public assistance programs and in particular uh, trying to expand work requirements for people who are on public assistance programs, including, as I say, Medicaid, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, strengthening work requirements under TANF, uh, and a range of other programs, SSDI and others. 
Um, there's a there's been a series of um, there's been a series of hearings on Capitol Hill over the course of the past couple of months where uh, congressional committees uh, have been looking at the role of work requirements across a range of different programs. Um, folks may have seen that the administration has authorized uh, the uh, states to apply for waivers to Medicaid eligibility to allow uh, able uh, to uh, allow or to require uh, that able-bodied adults without dependents be uh, subject to new work requirements under Medicaid. So, uh, and there are three states that have uh, that have been approved to uh, apply these work requirements to Medicaid recipients. Um, there's also a conversation that's likely to start uh, later this month uh, around um, the SNAP program, what used to be the food stamp program. Uh, there's an interest in expanding uh, work requirements for non-disabled adults without dependents uh, to uh, require uh, wor uh, greater work uh, uh, participation for individuals who are uh, benefiting from or who are receiving SNAP per, uh, benefits. Um, Overall, I think in, in most of the conversations here in Washington, the idea is that uh, is that individuals who are who have disabilities would be uh, exempt from these work requirements. Although, obviously, one of the conversations is what does that actually mean? What does um, you know? How will those? How will that exemption actually work at the state level? Um, I think the other issue is uh, is certainly if the if these work requirements do take effect in in a number of these programs, uh, that will mean that there will be a lot of folks who are not currently subject to work requirements who will need access to education and training services in order to be able to move into the labor market. Um, and that will likely uh, put a lot of pressure on existing systems to be able to provide the right level of services. Um, so I mentioned that it's, it's a conversation that I think is, is likely to continue to be ongoing over the course of the next, uh, over the course of the next uh, uh, year or so um, pending the outcome of the November election. Um, but for sure, something that the both the administration and congressional leadership have been looking at pretty closely. So um, I know I've, I've probably gone well over time, so I want to stop there. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. No, I think you're right on time. I think that that, that w went really well. Um, for people to ask questions, so there are several ways to ask questions. You can ask questions via the Q and A button. That's either on your bottom of your screen or to the right of your screen. Uh, you can also email us and uh, we have a survey. Um, Kermit, usually uh, I'll start off with the first question and give people time to, to kind of formulate their questions. Um, one of the, so the, the economic report of the president came out in February mm -hmm. and uh, from the national, uh, from the Council of Economic Advisors and uh, the third chapter really looked at labor force participation. And uh, in particular, uh, towards the end, it focused on, on uh, job mo mobility, both of jobs to come to places and people to be mobile outside. You know, so it's not just a matter of training, it's a matter of matching the, the place. Uh, I'm looking at the, the, the cart and... Uh, Background noise overpowering voices. So let me get a little closer. Well, that's a good thing to know about CART telling me that I'm not talking loud enough. So uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of the views uh, uh, that you have or some, anything you might want to say about mo job mo mobility of people in terms of moving around the country or within a state? Sure. I, so, um, so th this is a this is an issue that comes up uh, a lot. Uh, you certainly it came up uh, during the, the course of the Great Recession. Um, uh, this this question of you know I think there's really sort of two issues, right? One is about the availability of transportation within communities. Um, so. Uh, so there's there used to be you know, I guess there still are some programs that are available to communities to help provide uh, transportation assistance to uh, individuals who needed to get from their homes to their jobs within communities. So um, uh, uh, through the through the Department of Transportation and other agencies, I don't know that there's been a lot of discussion about updating those programs uh, here in Washington uh, recently. 
Um, the other issue, uh, getting at sort of mobility, is this is this sort of question about uh, helping people who are in one part of the country where there aren't many job opportunities, helping them get to other parts of the country. Um, there is a program called the the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program uh, that is uh, administered by the Department of Labor that does provide um, some relocation allowances for workers who are who are trying to move from from one geographic area to another. Um, but it's a it's a fairly limited program. It's only available for uh, individuals who've lost their jobs as a result of uh, foreign competition. Um, and uh, and it's it's not a tremendous amount of money. It's uh, I think it's I think it's capped at, at fifteen hundred or eighteen hundred dollars. Um, so uh, so certainly if someone's uh, uh, that that is not enough to really address uh, living expenses. But there, I, I do think that there is a, a, an understanding on on Capitol Hill that um, that that the economic recovery that we've seen, while while nation nationally there is. Uh, relatively low unemployment, and in some parts of the country, you have, you know, as close to zero unemployment as you can get. Um, and there are other places where you have relatively high unemployment. Uh, I have not seen a whole lot of uh, interest or momentum on Capitol Hill for trying to address that issue um, in terms of helping people move from one community to another. And, um, you know, and I will say, you know, as much as the administration has talked about infrastructure. Uh, as and, and and that would um, probably be the vehicle by which you could uh, try to increase funding for mobility. Um, there has not, I have to say that the um, that infrastructure conversation does not seem to be moving very fast right now. I think that um, Congress passed a law back in 2015, which was their most recent surface transportation bill. I think many congressional leaders feel like they've done. Uh, they've acted on surface transportation issues recently, and they don't feel any particular need to to put more money into transportation right now. So I think it's it's probably not an area that's going to see much activity over the course of the next couple of years, but definitely something that advocates should be paying attention to and, and, yeah. and fighting. Yeah. So so what one issue that the I'm hearing an echo of myself, but one issue that uh, the administration is going to have to hopefully deal with is economic growth. I mean, their tax policy is really dependent on a, a pretty strong uh, economy and pretty strong growth. And usually that comes through immigration and population, uh, increases in population. So in reducing the transaction cost of moving uh, could help that, um, uh, but uh, that remains to be seen. So there is a question from the, the audience, um, and I'll, I'll read it straight up. So. How is the new money for federal programs earmarked to be spent? Um, same percentage or, or different? And, and this may be related to the CER, um, if that's what's being called new money, or perhaps the tax. I'm not sure. Are you, I'm assuming this is the, the, the omnibus appropriations bill that was passed. Sounds like it from the question. Maybe the. the so the, the short answer is um, is that is that by and large the money that was appropriated through the, the so so uh, Congress passed this omnibus appropriations bill on March 23rd, um, and this was the consolidated appropriations bill that covered all of the different uh, defense and non-defense programs. By and large, uh, the the um, the funding level th there weren't there wasn't a lot of negotiation around sort of. Uh, in tr within funding streams, there wasn't a lot of discussion around uh, the use of funding. And, and part of the reason was um, there wasn't a whole lot of time. Uh, Congress uh, reached uh, a, a deal back in, in January around increasing the budget caps, uh, but they didn't have a whole lot of time to really negotiate around programmatic changes. And so a lot of what we saw in, in most cases was uh, either level funding for programs or increased funding for programs. Uh, but there wasn't there there wasn't a lot of sort of language within the the bill about sort of how the funding could be used. So you know as you're as you're thinking about you know sometimes in appropriations bills you get a lot of instructions around you know where funding needs to be allocated. We didn't see much of that in this particular appropriations bill. One thing I'll mention is um, and I didn't I didn't mention this in my um, so so folks may know. Um, it, we're we're still technically operating under the under the terms of the Budget Control Act of 2011. That's the the piece of legislation that brought us the sequester and budget caps. 
Um, so the deal that, that Congress reached back in, in January was a deal to increase the budget caps for both defense and non-defense programs for fiscal year 2018, which is the year that we're in now, and then fiscal year 2019. And so what we saw in the, in the omnibus was um, not huge increases, but there, uh, there was about, I think, uh, I think it was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, of $60 billion in additional spending that, uh, for non-defense programs. And so you did see a lot of sort of modest boosts for non-defense programs like VR and job training and career and technical education and others. I, I think that we expect that there will be less increases uh, next year, uh, uh, even though there's there's an increase in the budget cap, just because um, uh, the funding increases uh, reset the baseline for a lot of programs. So right. what we're likely to see next year is, is is relatively level funding for these programs. We're not expecting a lot of uh, cuts to, to, to non-defense programs. Okay. Well, we've actually run out of time. Thanks. That's a lot of good information about what what to look for in the future. Um, both Denise and you went through quite a few things that, that uh, we need to pay attention to uh, as we move forward. So thank you again, Kermit. Uh, thank you, Denise and John for uh, participating and thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Bye-bye.